Hey everyone, my name is Joshua Reeves. I'm the director at University Theater. And tonight we have a guest with us, joining us all the way from uh, the West Coast. I wanna say uh, you know, thank you for joining us to our Raleigh native and uh, major gifts officer at the Pacific Northwest Ballet, Jackson Cooper. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, great to be here. Awesome, Jackson, I asked this question of everyone before uh, we uh, get into the questions from everyone else. What does it mean to be a major gifts officer? Oh, I'm curious what everyone else has to say to that uh, question. But uh, I will say, um, so major gifts officer is kind of a fancy way of just saying fundraiser. It's um, a position that is commonly mis, um, misnamed. You, a major gifts officer can sometimes be a development director um, it all depends on the size of an organization, but pretty much my job is to uh, take care of donors uh, throughout all of the donor pipeline, as we call it. So when somebody comes to a show and then gets interested, gives a gift, and then um, maintaining them, continuing to give, I'm sort of the point person who uh, is in charge of all of those in collaboration with um, my bosses as well. Okay, so well, take us through a what do you what do you actually do? I mean, you know, we take care of people, we make sure we're fundraising, but what does that actually mean? Right. Yeah, I get this question a lot because people, um, because I'm I'm a very my job is very outward facing, so in uh, what we like to call frontline fundraising. So I'm the one who is in front of donors, doing the ask, and also going to visit them, meeting them at performances, putting notes on seats. And so a lot of people think that that's really all that it is, but it's a lot of strategy. It's a lot of um, administrative work, actually. A lot of people think that uh, a major gifts officer or development director gets, all they get to do is go talk to people, get to know them, go to coffee, go to lunches. But I actually spend quite a big amount of my time uh, in in, in the office and admit, I mean, not the office right now, but uh, in administrative tasks. And um, it's really sort of positioning people uh, through. So a lot of analyzing data, how often has a person come to a performance? How often have they given? If they've given, they're giving history in the community. So it's a lot of analytics and data. And then from there, uh, it's sort of numbers into emotional intuition, so strategy. So what we like to call in development, creating a plan. So if a person is very invested, for instance, at the $1,000 level, and I see that they give $10,000 at the art museum, I'm going to create a plan based on their giving history to get them up to a similar sized gift. Um, and again, that's sort of this wonderful marriage of uh, doing your homework, you know, looking at their history, and then you yourself uh, creating a plan that sort of aligns with what they um, their their giving habits and behaviors themselves. Okay. So it's a lot of it's a lot of um, yes, taking care of people, but a lot of my job is communication and uh, listening to people, hearing their stories, uh, hearing what they love about the ballet, and then aligning their giving with. Uh, programs and things within the institution that align with their passions and such. Nice. Um, so it's so again, it's a lot of positioning people and their uh, their own loves to uh, be more invested in the institution as a whole over time. Okay. Well, I do want to get back to what uh, you know how it actually all works. But before we do that, Jackson, uh, tell us a bit about yourself, like. So you're a Raleigh native. You grew up here in, in North Carolina? Yes, I was born right outside of D.C. in Manassas and then moved down here when I was about four. And I like to say that I was raised by Raleigh arts scene because when I was 14, I began working and fundraising uh, for North Carolina theater. Uh, the great Melanie Dorner, uh, who's the uh, former development director and the former CEO, Lisa Grelly Berry were really my mentors who got me interested because I had sent them an email after seeing a show and saying, I don't want to be on stage. I don't want to be backstage, but I really want to help like 
make people happy with theater. I really want to get people excited. I was so moved by just the sheer size of the audience and how we, when we think about theater, we talk about like a collective breath everyone takes in a performance, you know, when we're all just together in a moment. And I really recognize that power. And so I said, I really love theater and I really love shows and I love talking to people. And Melanie so kindly was like, well, there's this wonderful thing called development fundraising where you get to hear people's stories and talk to them about how amazing uh, theater is and and an institution that you believe deeply in, which I, I still adore and believe in North Carolina theater deeply. And so from there, I held internships until I graduated high school. I went to college, UNC Greensboro. I started, um, or I guess I created my own degree in arts admin. Uh, I was in the theater department, said I wanted to do this. I, I had been doing it. And they said, well, no one's ever done it, so you can't do it. So I went to the business school. Mm-hmm. I want to do this. They did not understand the concept of arts at the time to- or arts administration at the time. They since have, there is now a phenomenal arts administration program at UNCG in the business school run by uh, Hannah Greneman, who's an amazing, amazing um, faculty member and administrator. Um, but the business school didn't really quite understand what arts admin was. And so I just kind of mixed and matched my credits in theater and business to create my own degree. Um, worked in arts admin right out of college and did a variety of jobs. Um, the job market for a full-time nonprofit arts job in the Triangle, I sadly, is not as um, robust as it is in other major cities, but I still made it work. and. About a year and a half ago, I moved here uh, for this job in Seattle. So this is my first big, uh, big job outside of North Carolina, and I couldn't be happier about it. Awesome. Well, we miss you here in, in North Carolina. <laughs> I, you know, I'm a fellow UNCG or myself, um, yeah. and uh, and and grew up in Raleigh and and love the area. And we actually we have quite a few people online tonight. That uh, Michelle Weathers is here, and hopefully, hopefully Hi, she'll Michelle ask some questions. Um, so. Uh, Talk to us a bit about how, um, so you're at the ballet now, how, how does that translate from theater to dance? I mean, I know they're both arts, but, you know, do you find them uh, at odds or, or a little difficult to, to make that work? Well, I, I will give a shout out to Michelle Weathers, who also uh, I, I credit to uh, creating an arts admin lifer in me and uh, still uh, remains a a true um, inspiration to me. Uh, I do want to be here when I grow up. And um, I worked with her at Carolina Ballet and she was a, uh, she had worked for a long time as as an associate producer at uh, North Carolina Theater. And I remember uh, talking to her at one point and understanding that the difference between theater and ballet wasn't at all a very different. Um, they're both very much producing uh, mediums, and uh, so that you know that's very different than presenting. You know, something like Deepak or Carolina Theater is more presenting, uh, whereas Carolina Ballet, North Carolina Theater, they're producing their own shows uh, from the ground up, essentially. Um, but what I really loved about ballet was the thing I love about a musical theater, which is just, it's so high drama, high theatrical, uh, and and this, this also this high artistry. Um, and not saying theater can't do that, but there's something about musicals, operas, ballet, that there's this next level. And so the theatricality of both to me um, uh, I, I don't really see much difference in terms of how I approach the work mm-hmm. um, because they're both very performance based and uh, and so reliant on telling a story in such creative and powerful ways. Um, I just managed to make that transition so uh, beautifully. And I will plug um, Pacific Northwest Ballet many times today, <laughs> but uh, but specifically that when I came here, I was really, 
uh, overwhelmed by the level of um, artistry and theatricality that, uh, in, in the best way possible, that Peter Bowl, our artistic director, um, uh, his vision is just an incredible, and I highly recommend people to check it out. So, um, so I really love the correlation between the two. Awesome. And so, talk to us a bit about what has the Pacific Ballet been up to, and, and you in particular, since yeah. we've closed down back in March or you know April. Yeah, we're coming on on to uh, I think a year very nice. soon. Um, we. You know, Seattle was the epicenter of the virus. I think. I think it's. Um, I. I do like to remind people, especially back in North Carolina, that we were the epicenter, and so we really quickly had to pivot. Uh, the staff got sent home the day of um, the dress rehearsal for our third rep of the season, which had been rehearsing, had been ready to go, and so amidst this um, performance of a, 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 a of a PNB premiere um, that was very exciting, very beautiful. Uh, there was all this uncertainty, and we remained uncertain for a while. But we quickly had to um, hate the word; it's overused. But we had to pivot, and we decided we we decided on doing an all digital season. And our executive leadership, Peter Bull, our fabulous um, executive director, Ellen Walker, and our board and our uh, CFO all created a plan with King County, which is on, which we're in, and Seattle, city of Seattle. Our um, building is on Seattle Center campus where the monorail and the Space Needle are. So we've been working really closely with health officials from both the county and the city uh, to create a digital season. And it's been quite amazing when I say digital season, it's not just archival things. It is we are having dancers in pods rehearsing. Um, we're we're performing new works. We're choreographing new works. Um, we're premiering new works. We're recording on the stage. We're outfit. Uh, uh, Seattle Center kindly outfitted the state McCall Hall um, with cameras and sound equipment from Key Arena, um, and so it's been quite incredible. Uh, that we've been able to produce work during this time. And all the while, for me and, and our team of, of six in development, uh, which is very small uh, for a big, larger size organization, but um, we have just been keeping donors informed, keeping them excited, and keeping them really educated about where their gifts are going and how impactful uh, their gift right now is um, towards, you know, keeping our artists and such. Yes, there's the website. There's the website. So, and and how has the digital shift, you know, how have your audiences and donors, uh, you know, gone from watching things on stage, from watching them to on the screen? That's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, we did not see a, um, you know, I, I personally have heard from people who um, even to this day, even, you know, since September when we launched the season, uh, who still say, wow, that was really great, but oh my gosh, I missed the live performance. And I go, yeah, me too, me too. <laughs> as much as we want, as much as we love staying home and streaming stuff, you know, nothing does beat in-person performances. Um, but what has been really incredible about our digital space is that it's opened up a whole new audience and audiences from around the world. And so one of the things that we've been really proud of with the digital uh, season and, and um, in particular for me as a fundraiser is that it's created accessibility for communities who might not otherwise um, look at the ballet um, as being accessible or uh, they might not feel welcome, uh, that now they can tune in. And now they can for you know the price of uh, a ticket, $15, $17, uh, sit with their family and enjoy the Nutcracker at Christmas time, um, rather than having to worry about parking, 
going downtown and I've never been to a ballet before, so I don't know what to wear. Or I don't know if, you know, how do I buy tickets? It's really opened up this accessibility that uh, I think is really moving and I don't think should uh, at all go away in the future. And I don't think digital is going to be going away um, as, as our performance uh, component, strictly for that reason, because it opens up people from around the world to uh, tune in. Ah, and besides that lesson that we've all seem to have learned that digital yeah. has, uh, is going to stay with us, have there been any other lessons that, the, that you or uh, Pacific Northwest Ballet has learned in this time that we've been off the stage? It's, um, it's, we like to joke that we learn a lesson almost every hour um, and that we always create a plan and then the next, you know, two hours later we have to throw away that plan and we have to create another one. Everything seems to be a contingency plan these days, it feels like, um, because everything is changing. I think the biggest thing, um, I know the biggest thing that I've learned is that um, the personal conversations and really being very honest um, with people like donors, colleagues, managers about how you're doing, how you feel, what you're going through um, is not alienating. It is in fact very empowering and that builds a level of community that I think we've all been searching for in, and we talk about a lot in the arts, but I think having the very frank conversations about how are you doing? you know, I'm not doing well, you know, it's hard, you know, it's like, and saying that to your manager, or even, you know, I've had many, many very honest, beautiful conversations with donors about um, how this all is affecting their families, themselves, um, and just to have that person there, um, and to be honest, like, we can't hide it, we can't, so that creates a level of empathy and resilience that I think um, this pandemic has really taught us, um, and especially in the arts, that um, you know we've been we we preach that a lot, empathy and resilience, and the arts does do that. But when that translates into your workplace and into customer and donor external facing practices, um, it's really really important. The other thing, and I'll just add really quick, is. Um, the importance of things like accessibility um, and uh, anti-racism work, social justice, racial equity work, um, all of those things that uh, you know we we at PNB had been do had been doing uh, very intensely beforehand before uh, the George Floyd murder, um, but it definitely uh, ramped up in a good way. A sense of urgency, a sense of um, uh, a sense of implementation, uh, as well as being very thoughtful. Um, so instilling all of that within the practices going forward, along with the empathy and resilience, uh, has been two things to me that have been very, very important during this time. And, and since you've brought it up, uh, I was going to speak about this a little later, but you're currently working towards your MFA in arts leadership. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And um, MFA, he yeah. Can you talk a bit about your uh, research, your field of research, specifically? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, the, 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 yeah, so um, I'm working towards my MFA in arts leadership at Seattle University, um, which is a nationally recognized uh, program. Kevin Mayfield um, runs the program, has founded the program, and it's really incredible. And it's a, it's a program that creates arts leaders with a focus in social justice. And so everything that we do, whether it's a marketing in the arts, finances, fundraising, things like that, all is through uh, a social justice lens uh, towards racial equity and anti-racism work. Um, and my research so far has been on uh, decolonizing fundraising. So what post-COVID will uh, fundraising in the arts look like through an anti-racist lens? Um, and that has mostly been leading me down these paths of this big conversation about racial uh, wealth gaps and divides and um, a lot of conversations that are being had in not just the arts right now, but nonprofits and uh, funding where you know, the people 
on boards, in power, um, in foundation leadership, on foundation boards who hold a lot of money, uh, the redistribution of that wealth towards BIPOC, queer, LGBTQ plus communities, um, that urgency is, is really coming up. And so now part of my research is this focus on taking fundraising less from the pursuit of the rich, uh, white, influential, probably male donor that is at the center of fundraising and creating more of how are we promoting community and reflecting community in who is giving to our organization. So that's sort of a, a summary of, of the things that I've been working on in my benefit program. It's, very, it's been very exciting. Thank you, Jackson. And so speaking of philanthropy or, well, obviously we are talking about that, but, you know, for me growing up in, you know, as an 18, 19, 20 year old, and even into my late twenties, donorship felt like something that older rich people do. And, and so, you know, what, what are some ideas or what are your thoughts on, you know, instilling the the idea, the notion that donorship, that stewardship, that you know, giving is an important uh, part of our society. How do you how do we pass those ideals on to the next generation? That's a great question because I think the the funny thing that we're seeing is that this investment from generations, the the older generation, the 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 baby boomer generation, uh, the uh, as you say, the older rich people um, uh, that we normally associate with baby boomers uh, did grow up with a set of values of giving back uh, to the community in some way. And that's why I'm sure many of them serve on boards, uh, give a lot of their time, give a lot of their money uh, and stuff. There is that instilled. And I can't speak for the Gen X generation, but I know in millennials, it was through the lens of GoFundMes and like, I'm going to uh, fund my friend's you know, project and all that stuff. And in terms of charitable, uh, my generation, the millennials, and then the Gen Zers before me, it's a lot towards social justice causes, which I think is great. Um, but in terms of giving to the arts, uh, it is still stigmatized, I think, as being seen as entertainment. Uh, and that community value um, is still something that we need to strive for. So I think there's a real challenge, and I think COVID is the time to do it, to really show how communities need things like a ballet company, a symphony orchestra, an art museum, uh, because the generation that helped build those institutions within these cities um, are aging out. You know, and there has to be new community leaders, um, not necessarily new rich people, mm -hmm. but just community leaders who can advocate for the importance of the arts. Um, I know in, uh, in North Carolina, Nate at Arts NC State does a fantastic job uh, working on advocating for um, the impact of the arts across North Carolina through the North Carolina Arts Council. So, and we're seeing a lot of these advocacy movements sprout up, especially since uh, with the Save Our Stages campaign and um, everything that's been happening with the pandemic, um, suddenly this need for artists to be paid is being in the vocabulary of everyone. And so I'm just hoping that, you know, my generation and um, the generation after me understands the importance of, you know, giving $5 to PBS. Or, or the importance of supporting um, the local symphony at $100 a month, even if you don't go. Those mm -hmm. institutions are still important and still need to be there. Awesome. Great. So talk to us a bit about uh, what has been your most exciting project to date that you've worked on? I, as, as um, that's a great question. I would say as, um, 
you mean you mean for PNB or just or, or in general? Like, what is the <laughs> when you look back on your career today? You know, what is that th that one project, that one show, that one item that you're like that was? Man, I hope I get to that that again. I get to do that something like that again. Uh, it's not fundraising related, but I directed a production at UNC, not not playmakers, but for one of the student theater groups. Uh, when I was in college um, of a chorus line. And I remember that feeling of um, process and the collective, the collective sphere that everyone was on the same page and everyone not necessarily like understanding the show. I mean, everyone did, but everyone had this openness in the rehearsal room and the performance that allowed for um, trust and a lot of surprises to come up, like good surprises, like discoveries, you know, in it that happened in the rehearsal room. And I remember uh, it was closing night and I was driving back to Greensboro because I commuted from Greensboro to Chapel Hill every night to direct it. And I just remember going like, it's going to be a long time before I ever have a an experience like that it was one of those shows and and i'm sure you have it as a theater maker where everything just worked mm -hmm. and then more you know and and then magic happened and uh and i felt really proud of that and i still to this day even when i manage teams and um am in groups i always think back to that group dynamic and i go um how how can i get back to that you know that it was all healthy. Everyone was supportive. Um, we were, everyone like showed up, showed out. Um, so I would say that I was the most proud of. And of course, that's the one show of mine that was never recorded for archival. <laughs> never, I could never see that again and relive it. So I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of that. Well, great. And I was going to ask how have you pulled that forward, carried that into your work today? So that sounds like it's happening already. So that's, that's, that's great yeah. to hear. Uh, in your day-to-day -day operations, what uh, what position do you interact with the most? Um, I would say I work very closely with my uh, incredible boss, uh, who's we have uh, we have two uh, co-directors of development, um, and I work very much directly with her uh, with some with a lot of alignment with the rest of the department because uh, we're now a small staff of six and um, a, a lot with marketing. We have a very interesting structure which is um, pretty different than other arts companies where we have the marketing uh, department and the development department and we're together under one umbrella. So uh, called the rep and it's the revenue team we like to call ourselves. And so we work very much directly with marketing almost on everything, email related, social media, digital media, so that donors and audience members aren't overwhelmed by the amount of emails we send. Also that we're very thoughtful about how many emails we send because as, as, we, as everyone on this uh, call can admit, if someone keeps emailing you, you are going to unsubscribe. I mean, something as basic as that is not thought about in a lot of arts organizations mm -hmm. um, or how an email looks, the story it's being told. Um, it's the same with development. You know, do we put an ask on this email? Do we not? Um, so, but most of the time, uh, about 70% of my job, I interact with my boss uh, who I report to. And that is working with her on, um, uh, my portfolio and uh, the board and sort of projects coming up and stuff like that, which, is, um, which awesome. again has changed uh, a little bit, uh, has changed quite a bit with everything, but um, <laughs> the dynamic is, the dynamic is still very collaborative um, and she's just so great and inspiring. So I'm very lucky to, to be on this team. Awesome. And so you were saying at UNCG that an arts ad admin, uh, degree or a degree or at least uh, classes within arts administration was not something that was offered and it and it is a growing field um, yeah. so to students who might be at a school that 
are not interested uh, that are that are interested in it and they do not have that opportunities our uh one of our attendees rich asks if a student is interested in getting into the arts admin what would you say that would interest them in development and i'd add also what how could they start their career out as a student you know in a school that may not offer arts administration it's a great question especially because you touched on something very interesting that there are it is a budding field, especially in the uh, field of undergraduate arts administration. There, those are starting to come up. There's a plethora of master's degrees and graduate programs. Um, Seattle U is one of them. There's a, there's some at um, uh, uh, Drexel and and NYU, of course, has a really great one. Um, but for, for undergrads, yes. And I, I've mentored a lot of undergrads who have since gone into uh, fundraising uh, positions. And when I've worked with undergrads who don't have an arts admin program, I always tell them to um, continue your artistic pursuits. Um, that was something that, uh, so, so be an artist while being an arts administrator uh, and continue to do that. That was something that I've, continued to do, uh, especially in North Carolina. Uh, I conducted, I acted, I directed, and everyone said, oh, you do, you're doing so much. And I said, well, if I don't know what it's like to be on the other side of the table, then I, as an arts administrator, have failed. Um, because if I don't know what the artists feel or need from a director, from, uh, uh, you know, if I don't know what it's like to do the work and to uh, have the, you know, read the contracts and get, you know, get my check and everything, if I don't know that, then I can't go into an office where I'm leading artists and effectively understand um, what they need or if they ask me something and I'm surprised by it, like, no, I should, I should know that. And, um, so I always tell people to continue your artistic pursuit, whether you're majoring in dance or minoring or something, like keep up that work. Mm -hmm. And then I also say, you take a finance class, take a business management class, take you know an accounting class. I hated accounting, but you <laughs> need to know how to balance a, a, a you know how to read a balance sheet and a budget. Um, I also say public speaking and English. Um, as many writing classes as you can and as many uh, public speaking classes as you can, because those are the things that you um, really do need for when you write grants, uh, when you are writing a mission statement. Uh, and then what people don't tell you about the arts is that uh, once you do all that, then you have to present it a lot of the time. Either you're in front of a, a board or you're in front of a staff and all that. And the excuse to not be good at public speaking, even in a bare minimum way is, um, you know, I think, I think you have to have that if you go into the arts, no matter how introverted you are or extroverted, um, to be able to speak in front of a room uh, will get you um, farther in your path to success. Awesome. And hopefully we'll all be in a room together at some point soon. <laughs> some point. <laughs> right. So uh, thank you, Rich. And uh, I do want to remind everyone the Q&A is still open. So please uh, ask Jackson any question you want. If they're, he's right here waiting to hear from you. Um, so tell me, once you have developed these funds, uh, where, where do they usually go, at least the, the funds that you work for, uh, work with? You know, when I give my $5 to NPR, you know, where is that actually going? What is it actually being used for? That's a, um, I will, I'll try to answer that as best I can. Sure. Um, because every, every arts administration, every arts organization is very different in how they um, in uh, what we like to call the buckets. So in terms of where buckets go. But if you're going to give a donation uh, to PBS tomorrow of, again, $5 a month or something, and you do not specifically say this is going for, I want this to go towards your education efforts. I want to go towards this. It genuinely, it generally goes in, it's um, what what's called uh, undesignated. So it just goes 
into the company to fund its organization uh, operations and its programs. So uh, the money is then, you know, used in uh, what's called the annual fund, uh, which again, all goes towards uh, programs and operations and stuff like that. Typically for major donors, mm -hmm. um, I'm dealing with people who give about $5,000 and above. And um, people who have a lot of money are also much more careful about their money and where it goes and are a little more sensitive about um, knowing that it's going somewhere, even if they don't designate it. Uh, I also think it's a good practice as a fundraiser to, uh, to say, you know, to not only acknowledge and send a tax receipt, but also say, here's where your money has gone. So um, I call it, you know, you made a difference. It's like you always reach out and that's the stewardship part of, of the donor cycle, the sort of the fourth, last one, but of course it's a circle, not a line. Mm -hmm. So you tell people thank you and say, for instance, for PNB, when we were raising money at the beginning of the pandemic, um, under the auspice of our future funds, uh, one of the things that I said to donors a lot was saying, thank you so much. Your gift is literally keeping me employed and medically insured. And donors really appreciated that because otherwise um, they, they wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. and, and we've been very good. PNB is very good about um, saying your gift has been, has helped this and this and this, but it's in a time of a pandemic, it does really help, even no matter if, if they were going to give anyway or not, uh, I have found it very helpful to just say like, your gift is keeping our lights on because it is. And nine times out of 10, when you give to a nonprofit uh, and it just sort of goes to the organization, to PBS, to NPR, it is for that, for operational costs. Awesome. And in a you know, given year, let's go back to pre-pandemic uh, times, you, how many different campaigns or how many different specific um, giving uh, items were you working with? Uh, or was it just was it just one basic uh, general gift? Yeah, that's that's a great that's a great question. Uh, for me, it uh, as, as the major gifts officer, I worked very closely with our campaign that was $5,000 and above, uh, which is called our Members of the Bar campaign. And uh, those, again, because our threshold for a major gift is $5,000, so I worked on that campaign. And those were, uh, of course, people who give that, that amount, but also receive benefits that are uh, more personalized, uh, more access to uh, in studio or in studio rehearsals, which we can't do anymore, um, and uh, recognition and things like that. Uh, I'd also work very closely again with my boss and my other boss on um, uh, securing gifts for our new works. So we always have sponsors, individual uh, donors who give money towards funding a uh, a rep or a specific piece inside of a rep, you know, a new work or something like that. So I would work very closely on that. Um, our board of trustees always give an annual gift. And so um, that as well. And then a big part of my job too was just bringing new people into the ballet. I think the big thing that, uh, uh, the, uh, the big thing that you learn about fundraising is that your major donors are in your database. They're there. So I could spend two months trying to chase after Bill Gates, who lives right up the road, but it's going to be very hard, even if I get in front of him, to convince him to come to the ballet, because Bill Gates has not come to the ballet, to our knowledge. So I look into our database on people who have given, who maybe can give more. And that's kind of what I was talking about at the beginning, where it's doing all that research, it's doing all that analytics, and uh, really deep diving into numbers in order to say, hey, this person, I think he's given $5,000 to the opera, 
and he's been giving only $100 to us the last six years, I think it's time for him to move on. And that's when you reach out, you have a phone call, you talk about the ballet, and uh, you start that relationship. So, um, so yes, go ahead. You know, no, I was going to say, in, in that relationship, how, you know, is there a typical timeline as to how long it takes to develop that relationship? How long does it, you know, maybe yeah. it's not typical, but is there a typical timeline from reaching out to the actual ask? That's a great question. Um, I feel like I'm giving away all the secrets. <laughs> I hope every, I hope if, if you are a volunteer board member on this call that you, you can take all these to your next board meeting. Um, Typically, there's a great consulting group called the Veritas Group, V-E-R-I-T-U-S, um, and they define the lifespan of from, a, 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 from discovering a donor to giving a gift as about uh, six to eight months. So, uh, but again, for instance, when I came in, I did not have donors who were starting from point A, mm. you know, again, from that discovery. I, I had people who had been giving for uh, years and years and years, or trustees who have been involved in the organization for 20 plus years. So that kind of, but it, to your point, the prospect to get someone who maybe has never given, but just bought a ticket, but has very high capacity to giving a gift, that's about six to eight months, I would say. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Well, I am I am flying through my questions, so I hope our guests will start throwing some of these Q and A's. Um, yes. Let me, I do want to ask: um, Was there you, you mentioned accounting, you mentioned finance, but was mm -hmm. there one class in particular that you have found that has been invaluable to your current career? Um, that's a really great question. I will. I would say, um, I would actually, I would, this, this sounds very strange and I did not list it into my advice of people to give or classes uh, you should take. I really was very moved by when I took economics. Uh, it sounds very strange, but to learn how markets work and, uh, and that this is about to sound very dry, but uh, to learn how markets work, to learn how the stock market fluctuates in the history of like uh, the history of just money and how people give, how it works, um, really opens up a lot of doors when you're starting to really, really d uh, dive deep into fundraising. Um, as well, I really did. Uh, I took a class on um, taxes, on nonprofit taxes and stuff. And again, that's this. this these are not very <laughs> sexy answers. I know. No, but this I'm is, getting... this, we want to hear from you. What are yeah, those? Well, well, and like, but learning about things like tax laws and and stuff like that is very important. And then I took a business ethics class, which also was extremely, extremely helpful because it. Uh, it was something that I definitely, you know, you not, I, I was just, I, I definitely was interested in. Um, and it, it does give you a real sense of how to disseminate right from wrong. And to, to take that approach in a very emotional field like the arts, um, we sometimes get caught up in, uh, too much in the context of of something, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that it's very hard to put our foot down and to say like, no, we're we need to do this and we need to do that, and that's how a lot of bad habits perpetuate on things like boards and then inst smaller institutions and um, uh, how culture kind of perpetuates into a, a, a sometimes a sometimes positive but also most of the time negative in nonprofits um, is that some people don't know how to step back and say what is right for the institution and the organization. 
And so taking that business ethics class was very uh, helpful because that was a lot of critical thinking. And uh, again, it's like not to hurt people's feelings, but this mm -hmm. is what's best. And it was very HR kind of focused, but it was uh, it it helped me uh, feel less pressured to take things personally um, in such a personal field. I guess. Awesome. Well, let's switch back to the personal. Has there been a a major gift or a major um, a major donor that like that really sticks out in your mind? Is there a funny story you might have that? you know, about, you know, working with a, a donor or with a company? It's a great question. Um, it's a really great question. I, I will say uh, the my favorite donors are the ones who, um, who really just appreciate um, the things like a phone call, uh, a thank you note, a Christmas card. I love to write Christmas cards to all my donors um, and who really say thank you to that. Um, a funny, I guess a funny story. I'm trying to think of some. There's, I, I, I'm, I'm going straight for the bad. Of course. <laughs> I'm going straight for the, for the, for the, for the donors who, uh, who were uh, just a, a tad out of touch uh, uh. from reality, um, which, I don't encounter as much at PNV, but when I was back in North Carolina, um, I definitely did. Um, I, I'm just going to put it in, uh, I'm, I'm not going to specifically name one. But oh, and I, Andrew, please don't, no. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> but I, I, I have been very moved by um, when, when donors who when people that I've met from doing events similar to this, or uh, I had done a uh, volunteered for the Ollie Pro Osher lifelong learning program at NC State and stuff. When, when I see those people and they would come to performances of mine or, or when I was working at uh, the North Carolina Museum of Art, they would come and say hi. Uh, that to me was probably more important than if they gave a gift in my name or gave a gift period, uh, because to me, fundraising is less about getting the check. That's like 10% of the job, um, but it is that relationship building. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very proud of the fact that um, even though I've been doing this um, since I was 14, I'm very lucky to still have a lot of donor relationships that don't necessarily give me money mm -hmm. now you know it's like i still i'm i've been very um proud of the fact that i could cultivate those uh friendly relationships with people um throughout all of my uh, career and all of my jobs so i'm very i'm very very uh, proud of that okay well just to make sure we got it covered because it sounds like you hit it but I, was, I do have the last question is, uh, what's your favorite part of your job? Is that part of it or is there something else that we left out? No, I think it's that. I think I, I love people and, and uh, God, I love social gatherings. That's something I've really missed about, about theater. Um, I love my, my favorite part of, a, of my job is uh, actually talking to the donor talking to the people, uh, and not necessarily about PNB, not necessarily about ballet, but just getting to know them mm -hmm. and hearing people's stories. And I think that's really at the crux of fundraising. We put fundraising in such a, uh, it's so stigmatized because it's so attached to money, but it is that relationship management. Um, and treating people like people. So I really like in my job that I can be extremely honest and authentic uh, with the donors I have um, because I love the organization I'm with and I love what I do. So I really enjoy that aspect of it is being able to authentically talk about um, what I love and sharing that with others who also love it.
Awesome. Thank you, Jackson. And here's our last question. The same question we ask every night. If you had one piece of advice for anyone wanting to pursue arts administration or, or development, what would that piece of advice be? I just wrote a book chapter on advice I wish I had been told when I got into fundraising uh, for a book that's coming out this year. I'm very excited about that. And uh, I like to tell people, especially when I'm talking to undergrads who are getting into it, that the thing I wish I had been told was um, no one's going to take care of yourself except you. And uh, self-care, you know, taking care, taking care of yourself, know your boundaries, name your boundaries, have that work-life balance. It's very hard in the arts. Uh, you know, we're expected to sleep at the theater and then show up in the office the next day. And, uh, but taking time off, taking time for yourself, um, having bad days, uh, all those things that contribute to making sure that you don't burn out, uh, you don't lose uh, the love of the arts. I, you can never lose it, but it can be really patted down by the uh, minutia of doing it every day, all day. Um, so if you don't take care of yourself, um, it's going to be a very, very hard um the days are going to be very long. I wish someone had told me that. Uh, I had to learn the hard way through a lot of burnout, a lot of um, overextending myself. And um, I continue to tell people, I say, you know, have a life outside of your job, have a life outside of your, you know, theater and whatever, have hobbies, take a walk, exercise, do all the things that make you happy. Uh, and the theater will be there tomorrow. Yep. And your job will be there tomorrow and it's okay like life can stop at 5 p.m in the arts just like it can any other field but Thanks. yeah i would say that take care of yourself because no one uh, you know because you're the only person who who can awesome thank you jackson and um thank for that job. book though, that's coming out are you able to tell us the title of the book yeah it's uh it's not available for purchase yet uh but it's uh, called alternative careers in performing arts it's produced by routledge um and it's uh little chapters on uh career advice for other careers in the performing arts that uh, do not include acting and directing and stuff awesome so that will be coming out uh hopefully end of this year or beginning of next but routledge will be uh publishing that Look forward to seeing it. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us tonight on Strictly Speaking. Jackson, I hope you uh, stay safe out there, stay warm, and um, thank you so much for joining us back in Raleigh. Thank you so much. This has been great. Right. Take care, everyone, and have a great night.